Good afternoon, everyone. Our third seminar for this semester is by Matt Carrick. He'll be talking about introduction to fresh filtering. Matt uh, get, got his bachelor's from George Mason in 2000, 2007, his master's from Virginia Tech in 2009, and then he worked at SAIC for a couple of years and then joined here for PSG again. He is the go-to guy for any issues on the radio, signal processing, or anything. And so he's talking about some signal processing aspects today. Okay. So. Right. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for coming out. Like you said, uh, my name is Matt Carrick. I'm going to be talking about fresh filtering today. So I want to provide just a quick example, uh, kind of scope out what I'm going to be talking about. So uh, there seems to be a lot of talk in the lab on how do you cause interference to somebody else effectively, and I'm kind of on the other side of that, which is how do you remove it? So if you receive, I'll talk about this example throughout the presentation. So you have some desired signal some signal of interest, which is a BPSK signal here, and you get some noise interference on top of it. So how do you mitigate that interference? What are your options? So you have a couple ways. You can do it with modulation. If you use frequency hopping, you can use spread spectrum. Uh, they're bandwidth inefficient. They're effective, though. You can use error correcting codes uh, to try and mitigate that interference. The problem with that is you need to synchronize to the signal uh, to make use of those codes. And if you can't synchronize, uh, you're not going to be able to get there yet. So you, other, you have some other kind of options similar to frequency hopping, which is you could notch a spectrum, vacate a band if you have some other bands available to you. may not be possible, but again, bandwidth inefficient. So what are your other options? So one way is you can use a filter to get rid of that interference. So uh, the first way you can start is you say, let's pick a filter, W, and then we'll figure out what those optimal filter coefficient should be if I minimize the mean squared error. So D is my uh, ideal signal or desired signal. And I have, on top of that when I receive it, interference and noise. So if you go through this, you get the work from, I think it's Kolmog Kolmogrov, I don't know how to pronounce it, and Wiener. So this puts us back in 1942 and 1941. So uh, Wiener did it in the frequency demand. And, Komogrov put it in the time domain. So you get a design equation that looks like this, assuming an FIR filter. So you get this relationship between the optimal filter coefficients and the, uh, the autocorrelation of X, your received signal, the cross-correlation of your desired signal, D, and your received signal, X. So what do you do with that? To, how, do you, how do you actually get those filter coefficients out? So you write this equation. Or, Basically expand that convolution of the system of linear equations, write it as a matrix, and then you invert your autocorrelation matrix to get your optimal filter coefficients out. So what does this actually look like? So going back to that same example, this is my uh, desired signal, so I have some noise and interference on it. The linear filter, what it'll do is it'll attempt to balance how much of the interference and noise you get rid of versus how much you distort the underlying signal. So you see it puts this deep null here. Like I said, the problem is, yes, you get rid of the interference, but you also distort your underlying signal. So this is a balancing act. You can never remove it perfectly uh, when you have interference that's in band. And we'll talk about this one much more than this slide. But what happens if you have uh, channel effects, you have multipath, and you get a null in your signal? How does that, how does the linear filter impact this? So in this example, you have nulls in your signal. Uh, so your linear filter is going to attempt to restore this spectral shape which it will do, but it also amplify the noise and color it. And that's not something we want to have happen either. So uh, the Wiener filter works well for stationary series, time series, like uh, white noise, or if you have a base-banded and decimated signal. Uh, but what if it's not stationary? What if it's up oversampled or upsampled? Uh, like most communication signal are, uh, what can we do? So in this case, we have signals that look like this. You have a bunch of bits, and it goes through a symbol map. Then you get out, in this case, a BPSK signal. You have a bunch of plus ones and minus ones. So I have this dividing line. So on this side, it's stationary. So at any time index, the distribution or the likelihood that you get a minus one or plus one is the same. Once you cross this boundary where you've upsampled it, now you have a cyclostationary signal. So when you, this happens to be four samples per signal. That's four samples per symbol. So the signal at the zeroth index, you have this probability of uh, 0.5 to be plus 1, minus 1. But when you change the index, so for 0, 4, 8, 12, and so on, you get one distribution, and it's periodic. Uh, 
according to that four samples per symbol. And then when you move to the next one, you get a different distribution. In this case, it's trivial. It's always zero. But when you filter it, uh, you get something that looks like this. You have a cyclostationary signal in the time domain. You have this baud rate. But what happens in the frequency domain? So when you have a stationary signal, you have some, uh, some spectrum according to that signal. You go through an upsampler. And now you have a cyclostationary signal. So if you sit down and work with the math, what happens when you upsample signals, you get perfect spectral copies. Uh, I'm not going to go through why. You just have to trust me. So if you look here in the middle, and you, have, you basically take this piece of spectrum, you shrink it, and you have a copy here, then you have a copy here, here, and then one wraps around plus, uh, plus minus Fs over 2. Because we don't want to use extra bandwidth, we then put it through a pulse shaving filter to knock these side levels down. You can still see we have a copy on this side. This half is the same information as this half. So we have this redundancy. Sometimes you hear, so a couple ways to describe uh, what this redundancy is. Sometimes you hear spectral redundancy. Sometimes you hear spectral correlation. So we have this redundancy. So like we have an error correcting code, if we have redundancy, we should make use of that to get rid of noise or interference. So we have this spectral redundancy not so much at the bit level, but we have it at the signal level. So how can we make use of that? So if I have redundancy, and let's say this example, uh, what I should be doing, yeah. So any signal can be somewhat with the cyclostationary spectrum. If it's, my understanding is if you have a stationary message, you upsample it, you get a cyclostationary signal out. There's other ways to get it. So if you have, let's say, filtered white noise, you put a carrier on it, that carrier creates a cyclostationary signal. Well, you can you mean you can pick any number. You can pick integers numbers. You can pick not any rational number or whatever you want to pick. Would, would, would the redundancy be increase the sampling? Like yeah. So if you go so right right here, I have four copies. So if I overlap and add all of those, I'm going to get better performance out versus in this case. I essentially have two. All right. So I get a better, more just ways for me to get more gain out of it. More. It's it's basically essentially one way to think about it is you have a better code. You have more redundancy. Like if you increase the oversampling, you reduce your rate. What do you mean rate? What do you mean your bandwidth efficiency is decreased? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, right. So I have this redundancy. So how do I actually make use of this? So before we get there, I want to add a little bit of math in here. So if you go dig through uh, the the works that talk about fresh filtering, you see a lot of talk about second order periodicity. And it's not, it's hard to think about. It's a lot easier to think about this in the frequency domain. So the time domain, you basically say, how well does it correlate with a complex sine wave or frequency alpha? That's hard to think about intuitively. So if you think about it in this frequency domain, you say, OK, I have two signals, xt, I have this underlying signal uh, shifted, in this case, to the right by alpha over 2, in this case, to the left by alpha over 2. So how do they correlate uh, in, I'll use the word cycle frequency. So alpha is the cycle frequency, meaning these are the frequency shifts it correlates against. So, uh, so this is the magnitude of the cyclic spectrum. And this is a visual representation of how well the signal correlates with itself in the frequency domain, cor corresponding to those cycle frequencies. So for cycle frequency of 0, you have no frequency shifts, right? So you, when you look at from this direction for alpha is equal to zero, you just get the PSD out. And that kind of makes sense. So when you have a cycle frequency shift or a cycle frequency of 0.5 in this uh, bottom left hand corner here, you move the signal instead of uh, so we we're shifting by alpha over two. So you move this top one by 0.125 to the left, the other one 0.25 to the right, multiply them together, and then you get this shape out. So if you look here, you get that, and then if you uh, do that for the other cycle frequencies, you get those are the shapes. So you also see here that uh, you get these are zeros. This is a linear plot. So it's also zero for all those other cycle frequencies. So uh, so we talked a little bit about what the cycle frequencies are for BPSK. What about other waveforms? So if you want to build a fresh filter for this, you need to know what the cycle frequencies are and their waveform dependence. So if you go dig out two of William Gardner's papers, uh, they pretty much describe any 
single carrier waveform I can think of that give you what the psychofrequencies are and how well the signal correlates with itself. So what does the fresh filter structure look like that can incorporate uh, this spectral, spectral redundancy? So it looks something like this, which is you have some frequency mixers on the front end, and then you put it through a filter, and then sum all of them up uh, afterwards. So what are the design equations? So the design equations was very simple for the Wiener filter, and this is really nasty. So we're not going to go through every single bit of this, but we'll make some simplifying assumptions to get it so it's reasonable. So first, I'm going to deal with real signals. X is only going to be real. And we're only going to deal with two cycle frequencies, zero and alpha. So then we get those two nasty equations down to two more simple ones. So if you go back and look at the Wiener filter, you would compare to get the uh, filter coefficients out. You would have this term and this term. But now you have this extra term in here. So what is this telling you? So what this is trying to do is it's trying to determine how much spectral correlation you have between x and when x is shifted. So you, one way to think is when you have uh, this cyclic spectrum plot, what is the alpha for BPSK when it's 0.25? That is essentially what it's trying to measure. How much frequency content uh, is replicated at this frequency shift? So if you look at the other second equation, this one's a little, it's not as intuitive, but again, we try to measure what the frequency content is from the original baseband version versus when we shift it. So if you go through and plot all those different, basically the known quantities in there, you get these magnitudes out. So to try and provide some kind of intuition on this, if you start at the top, we're trying to take uh, this filter W1, multiply it by this cyclic spectrum, add it with the other one, and get out uh, this here on the right. So uh, if you try and sum up the magnitudes, I've tried to add some color in there for some intuition. So you take the black and if you cut it on the left side from all the negative frequencies, you get a much darker uh, shade here on the right because you're adding more of this piece that has no, uh, no shift to it. You get a lighter shade on the other side from this spectral, force con spectral correlation. On the right side, same is true for the uh, bottom row. So what we want to do, we want to get back to the time domain uh, like we did for the Wiener filter. It's a little more intuitive to get the filter coefficients out. So you take the inverse Fourier transform, you expand the convolution, and now you get, uh, these are referred to as the multivariate Wiener-Hoff equations. So this tells you what your filter coefficients are, A1 and A2. So now, you have multiple correlation matrices, you invert that, multiply it by your cross correlation uh, column vector, and you get your filter coefficients out. So let's look at an example. So I receive BPSK with some tones, uh, and then I have white noise on top of that. So I'm using two cycle frequencies, 0 and 1 over T, and I, uh, I apply the Wiener filter first. So, like I said prior, I to get rid of these tones, the Wiener filter can't do a whole lot other than try and drive them down to the noise floor. So I still get some distortion, although I mitigate those effects. I still get some distortion of the underlying desired signal. But what can I do with this uh, fresh, fresh filter or cyclic Wiener filter? How does this operate? So on the top here, you notch the tone out. We look at this one based on point 0.1. So I notch the tone out with my first filter. So I know because I have a cyclostationary signal, I have these perfect spectral copies. So if I shift it, so for example, this here, if we consider just the desired signal, this lump of energy is the same as this lump of energy, it's the same as this, this, and it's embedded in here as well. So what I should do is provide, basically frequency shift this signal, so I know that the information here is a perfect spectral copy, ignoring the noise, from what I just notched out here. So what I should do is bump that signal power boost it, and then add it where I notch it out there. So when I filter both of these signals, I put them both together, add them up, I get a much cleaner result here. So intuitively, just looking at it, you would think, okay, that this is probably a better estimate. So this is just to show the difference. So you can see here, I'm not, not I'm notching it here, but I also get some weirdness. Over here, here it's very smooth. And this is just with two cycle frequencies. So what if I start adding, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, 
kind of what he was saying before is uh, the less spectral correlation you have, which is if you don't have these lumps, you're going to get less gain when you add them up. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So this is this is chosen. This is a poor. You would never use this filter, but it gives me a better example to present. Does that answer your question? So. What if I provide, so instead of just using those two cycle frequencies, just, what if I use a bunch of them? What kind of gain do I get? So this red line is the performance of the Wiener filter as compared to the match filter. So we'll call that 5 dB. So as I, once I add my second uh, cycle frequency, that second shift, I get, let's call that 8 dB. So I get a 3 dB boost right off the start. And then I get this, these diminishing returns. So why do we get diminishing returns? My experience is, what happens is, you get the largest gain here, because you, once you have this cycle, second cycle frequency, you essentially cancel out the interference perfectly. When you get to these, uh, when you get to this diminishing returns, you're trying to burn through the noise. So one way to think about it is you've added, uh, uh, I guess the way I think about it is, essentially what you've done is, because you've oversampled the signal, you've made a much longer period. So you're trying to integrate out the noise, and that's harder to do and expensive in terms of bandwidth. So quickly, I want to talk about some practical considerations. So what happens if you don't know what that cycle frequency is exactly? What if you're off by a little bit? How does that impact things? So this example talks through it a little bit. So this is a normalized cycle frequency area here, hidden, but this is 10 to the minus 5. And so the question is, so I have on this red one, this is my performance of my Wiener filter. And the blue one is my uh, fresh filter. So what's this crossover line right here? So if I just assign some numbers from to this previous example, let's say my baud rate's one megahertz, my sampling rate seven megahertz, this number right here turns out to be 14 hertz, which is incredibly tight. Uh, and that's just the crossover point, right? You really want to be up here at the, uh, the near curve, which is much smaller. So that is a concern. I also didn't give any numbers on this one, so I want to talk through this a little bit. So the input SNR on this one was 12 dB. My SIR uh, was 5 dB. So this, when you put these two together, you get an input SINR 4.2. When you get the output, you get 16.8. So this is larger than both of these numbers. So you, the way I think about this is you burn through the interference almost perfectly. Then you start to eat through some of the noise because you have all these spectral copies. So... To, to try and show you, yes, it's true, you burn through the interference perfectly. What if we run this test over multiple SNR values and over multiple SIR values? So I'm running this over SIR values of 0 dB, 3 dB, and 10 dB, and then I vary the input SNR at the bottom here. So regardless of the signal interference ratio, you basically get down to the noise and attempt to uh, burn through that, irrespective of what the actual value is. So... Uh, I didn't get to any of my research today uh, for the reason that I, between uh, signing up for this presentation and uh, giving the talk, I was asked to put a patent through for my work. So unfortunately, I can't talk about today, maybe for another time. But it kind of cuts out a lot of material I could talk about today. So uh, just to wrap up the conclusion, uh, Wiener filters reject interference, but the problem is, like I said, is you start to distort what your underlying desired signal is. Your fresh filter incorporates spectral correlation to reject that interference, so it's another form of redundancy we can use at the signal level, actually the bit level. So that gives us an additional lever, le layer of protection or performance that we wouldn't have otherwise. And then fresh filtering tends to be noise limited. So I say tends to, it's not perfectly, if we have more, like we were talking about earlier, if we have more spectral copies, we can start to burn through it, but that's very inefficient. So that's all I had to, for today. Any questions? So, well, it's, it's longer than the 90s, right? I mean, it's been through like 75. So why? Did, I think, in my opinion, I don't have, I don't know what the answer is. I can speculate. So my speculation is the answer is I think it was ahead of its time. I think. Uh, I mean, what were people really doing in terms of radio signal pro digital signal processing in the 80s? I mean, it's pretty limited, right? So now we're, you don't have one filter, you have multiple filters. I think there's that problem. 
I, I think, uh, I think some of it is it's non-intuitive as well. So, I mean, I sat on this for months and just said, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing here. And one day it clicked. So I think there's also this me of, it's hard to just get in there, get in the field. More computationally complex is reference to what? Well, that's the cyclostation analysis. It's a little something different. I'm just talking about the filters, right? So, uh, work I presented is if you have you're doing the Wiener filter approximation to it, uh, you have to do twice the amount of computation, which I don't think that's that bad these days, given that you can get the three dB, four dB performance boost off of it. I think that's a pretty good trade off. Uh, I'd like to think so, but I, I don't know. I mean, at some point I'll use it in practice, but I don't know. Any other questions? Have you tried any other higher order modulation script? Would, be, would it be the same? Uh, so, yeah, so this. I, think so what I mean, it's modulation independent. It doesn't really matter. So, uh, as long as you have the stationary message, which is BPSK, it could be 1024 QAM, it doesn't really matter. It just comes out. So the, I mean, the filter, we're not looking at bit error rate curves. We're just looking at mean squared error, and SI and R, right? So the what the underlying modulation has just kind of pops out at the end. It's independent of that. Yeah. Well, LTE, are you talking about OFDM? OFDM, when you add the cyclic prefix in, is cyclostationary. Okay. Um, so, so this thing can it could be, and there's people that have presented on that. So jamming can be removed? Like if you know where it is, then you can remove it? Uh, yeah, the gains tend to be limited. There's not a whole lot of spectral correlation to get into the details. It's not, the cyclic prefix doesn't give you as much gains as this does uh -huh. as by just oversampling the signal. Uh, so I don't know that it's going to be as effective. Okay, so you have, so I, uh, I got it. So when you look at the cyclic spectrum, the magnitude, there's a lot of repetition in mine, right? There's a lot of peaks when you look at that. So that means there's a lot of gain possible. When you look at the cyclic spectrum of OFDM with a cyclic prefix on there, it looks, it, there's, it looks like there's almost no spectral correlation. So what that means is there's not a lot of gain to be had from that signal. Can you tell us about the patent that you find? No. <laughs> That's it. I mean, we, we can stay in here all day, but I, I got nothing else. <laughs>